This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello there and welcome to episode 124 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Today's topic is hiking when you travel. Uh, So we can, uh, just by listening, I reckon, feel fit and strong from all the hiking we're going to listen to. Nearly as good as doing it yourself, I reckon. Um, Before we get on to the hiking stories, I do want to welcome back this month's sponsor, Flytographer. So with Flytographer, you can come home from your next trip with the awesome souvenir of professional photos of you and your travel buddies in amazing places around the world. Flytographer has a network of photographers in hundreds of cities around the world. Um, In this episode about hiking, we cover a lot of ground, (laughs) haha, pun intended, with talk of hiking on five different continents in our chats, uh, ranging from Australia to Romania, Morocco to Costa Rica. Um, But yes, Flytographer has photographers in several cities of each of these countries and they're adding more all the time. So you can look up your destination, find a photographer you like the look of and book them for an hour, ending up with really great pictures to take home with you. I feel like I would rather like to have um, one of these uh, photography sessions uh, after a big hiking trip when I'm feeling very strong and muscly from days and days of walking. So maybe that's when I'll use them next. Um, you can book a shoot on their website, flytographer.com, and get $50 off by using the code AMANDA50. Now, as for my own hiking tales, I know somewhere along the lines, I'm sorry, I can't remember which episode, but uh, I'll try and look it up later. Uh, I have told my story of hiking up Mount Fuji and where the hiking up went down, but the hiking, the hiking up went well, but the hiking down ended up in getting lost. (laughs) And uh, after a a great deal of hassle and some, uh, a lot of kindness from local Japanese strangers, we uh, managed to catch up with the bus that was meant to take us back to Osaka. Uh, Now, there's a saying in Japan that uh, everyone should climb Mount Fuji once, but only a fool climbs Mount Fuji twice. But (laughs) I'm clearly a fool. I was pretty much a fool the first time. But I do really want to take my son up Mount Fuji one day, so I'm sure we will do that. Uh, and we've also talked about walking a Camino trail one day as well. Who knows where else? He's getting pretty much to the age where he could outwalk me, I reckon, so it won't be long before we uh, find some kind of good hiking trip, I think. Often it's a matter of time. I'd like to do something a bit longer, but, you know, we have to keep getting back to school and work. Those are annoying things sometimes, but uh, anyway. So my first guest today is Greg Seymour, who is a very experienced hiker, and I started out by asking him what he thought was difficult about hiking. The biggest difficulty would be the Appalachian Trail because it's, it's you know, a, a cumulative fatigue over 2,200 miles. Um, it's just such a an interesting thing to hike 15 to 20 miles every single day, um, maybe taking one day off a week. Um, and so, so that, that would be the most difficult. Um, but you know, we tend to enjoy, um, outdoor activities. So almost everything that we do involves hiking. Currently we're house sitting, uh, actually for a couple who, um, is, uh, through hiking the Appalachian Trail this year, they found <laughs> us on our YouTube channel uh, and reached out to, and they knew we wanted to uh, write a book about our adventures. They said, hey, we have a house. We're going to be gone for six months um, if you want to write your book there. Um, <laughs> and so so we're house sitting in Michigan, which we've never been to Michigan. Perfect. And, and we go for a hike almost every single day. Uh, the, the area where we're at is near Lake Michigan. And um, there's just hiking trails and state parks and uh, all sorts of um, fun things to do. Wow, that's excellent. So even when you're not on a hiking trip, you're hiking. Right, right. We really enjoy, um, you know, the animals you see and just being outside. Um, You know, we spent some time over the winter in Wisconsin, and that was very challenging because I don't really care for um, snow Mm -hmm. uh, that's really deep. And so we didn't walk. We didn't walk as much during the winter, uh, but once we got here to Michigan in the spring and the snow cleared, um, yeah, we we were hiking 
at least four or five times a week. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so what is it specifically about hiking that gives you such a buzz? Obviously, if you keep doing it so much, it must be something that's really kind of feeding your soul. What is it about it that you really love? You know, um, I, I think we really got into it uh, when we lived in Costa Rica. We lived in the mountains of the Central Valley. Um, you know, m- most people think of Costa Rica as a as a beach country, but mm. the interior um, has has a ton of mountains. And we lived on the slope of a volcano. Uh, and, um, we could walk out our door, you know, and a, a mile and a half later be at, uh, you know, a 80 or a hundred foot waterfall. Um, so it wow. was just beautiful. And I think that's what feeds my soul is, hmm. is the nature, uh, that's all around us, uh, whether it be wildlife or the, the glor- glorious views. Um, obviously in, in Costa Rica, we had the temperate climate, which was, you know, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit year round. Um, So it was just ideal. Mm. Um, You get sunshine and, you know, it's uh, much better than being holed up in in a house. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not a big hiker, but perhaps just by, I don't know, lack of experience. But uh, anytime I can get out into the the outdoors and have like a vast view in front of me, that just, and, and, you know, full of nature, that just really does... um, does make me happy for days so and here in australia we've got it's not too hard to get places where there's nothing else around except you know the bush or um you know a big view so it's something that i do try and do pretty often yeah and i would imagine you have quite the wildlife viewing there oh absolutely yeah that's right actually um just tomorrow i'm headed down to my to see my dad he lives kind of in the bush um about an hour and a half south of perth and he lives yeah just on a bush block and there's uh, quite a few um interesting native animals that come up to his uh, to his door at night once it's dusk or late evening and uh, always like to you know spot the wildlife there and if you go walking out during the day all the bird life and stuff is amazing so outstanding yeah, yeah very very lucky chatting to greg definitely makes me want to go hiking some more um, he really makes, he reminds me of what I like about it too. Um, he also reminded me uh, when I was speaking about uh, the animals you can find in my uh, dad's block in the bush and I did a little bit of research and I really didn't realise quite how impressive southwest Western Australia is. It's such a wildlife hotspot um, because it's very old landscape, like it hasn't been you know, changed. We don't have fault lines or earthquakes and stuff with a stable climate. And apparently that combination means there's heaps of species of plants and animals uh, that aren't found in many other places, if any. So I found that a quite a fascinating little tidbit of knowledge about my local area. And I will leave a link in the show notes to an article about just that. So there you go. Um, we find all kinds of things around there. Um, possums, quenders, numbats, woilies, lots of animals that you probably don't even know what they are. So hop on Google and you will. Now, my next guest today is Eva, and she is now an awesomely experienced hiker. But what gives me hope um, cause I've seen, you know, I've seen and read and talked to her about some of the amazing hikes she's done. Um, but she didn't even like hiking, uh, as a young person or even as a young adult. So, uh, there's hope for anyone, I think, cause now she's done some amazing stuff. I've never really liked hiking when I grew up because my parents always made me like we. <laughs> Such a German thing. A lot- yeah. We spent quite a bit of, you know, Sunday afternoons out in the woods and, of course, like when, when you're, I don't know, eight or 10 and your parents say, Oh, let's go for a walk or let's go for a hike. You're like, ah, no, I just want to stay here and watch TV or read a book or something. And of course, when we were out there, I, I loved it. You know, we had so much fun. We didn't want to come home, but you know, the <laughs> thing, the thought of it was always like, ah, no, I don't like it. And, um, that actually continued like forever. I, like if somebody asked me, do you want to go for a hike this weekend? I would be like, ah, no, thanks. You know, and and then um, I after I went to Egypt with my parents, I had this idea that I want to do like a camel trekking trip somewhere. Uh-huh. And I started researching, trying to find something like that. And the only thing I could find that came remotely close was um, a website of a German uh, travel agency uh, that was called Desert Hiking. In, just in, I mean, German, but, you know, translated yeah. to desert hiking. And I thought, huh. And they had a trip in Morocco where you could rent a camel for riding. And I thought, oh, see, that, there you go. So I could just ride my camel instead of hiking <laughs> and do that trip. And, you know, it's reasonably priced and, you know, it's Morocco. It's not too far away. And, you know, so 
that was my first real hiking holiday. And, you know, it was advertised as the easy tour, which it also was. But I think thinking about your first hiking trip to be like eight days in the desert still seems a bit extreme to most people. <laughs> eight days is quite extreme for your first go. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, you know me, I'm the one to jump at any challenge and go for it. And, yes, you know, not think twice. <laughs> so, um, I, I did book the camel <laughs> on top of it. You, you know, it wasn't that expensive uh, considering that it would give me the safety of not having to train too much. And, you know, if I, uh, if I found out that, you know, I actually wasn't fit enough or it was just too exhausting or my shoes didn't fit or whatever, you know, although my hiking boots were actually broken in, I, I had worn them on short things around, you know. Very wise. Um, yeah, yeah. So that wasn't a problem. But, um, but yeah, um, I ended up just riding just because I had paid for it and not because I needed it. <laughs> so, I'm going to use that camel. <laughs> yes, I made it a point to sit on it for an hour every day. But, you know, actually the hiking was really great. Um, we started off just, um, well, the first bit was actually sort of zigzagging up a really steep mountainside. Um and then sort of slowly walk down through an old like riverbed or it, I guess it turns into a river whenever there's rain, but it's not like it was actually in the rocks. So it sort of lo almost looked like molten lava because oh, it was polished yeah. so nicely. And it was mostly like big blocks of mm. rock, you know, you could, it was really kind of interesting. I mm. never seen something like that before. It went on for a day pretty much, wow. you know, full day. Trip. We just walked down that. Um, and then we crossed like sort of rocky desert for two days. And then we finally, finally saw the first dunes. And, um, you know, even though that's really, really exciting and optic, like visually pleasing, um, yeah, it's uh, not that much fun when you hike because walking in the deep sand is actually the most exhausting thing you can do. It's imagine. really hard, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for some reason, I was totally full of energy and, you know, walked up every dune for the views. And, you know, I loved it. It was great. And you actually, wow. because we were just a group of four plus our guide and then the crew that took out our stuff with the camels on a different route, you could actually get into a very meditative mode, you know, mm. because if no one was talking and you would just, you know, walk in your rhythm and you could really relax and there's nothing really to see. I mean, it's pretty, you know, to look mm -hmm. at, but it's not, there's nothing that takes your mind off just the walking, the rhythm, thing. you know, your mm, rhythm. Like beautiful. So, you know, I actually, I've never in my life been that relaxed, I think, until now for my recent hiking trip, I think, you know, because yeah. that was similar. But, so I actually loved it. And, um, in the end, uh, it was good that I had my camel with me because one of the other girls on the trip um, was like, she came from a bit of a difficult background and had never been on a holiday and ha had never been hiking. She hadn't walked in her shoes before. And um, so she had like blisters that, oh my God, the oh. feet were open. It wasn't even funny. So mm. we had to help her out with everything because she didn't have she didn't even know what to do with that because apparently she had never had a blister in her life before either and so you know she ended up riding on that camel a lot more towards the end of the trip than i did but um and i I'm, of course i was glad to share they all chipped in for the tip for the guide that uh, walked with the camel um so that was nice um but yeah that was my my hiking uh experience in morocco and i when i sat in that plane on the way back i thought oh that was the best holiday I've ever had. And I've had some really cool, exciting holidays before in my life, but I've never been that relaxed before. And yeah, it was really, really, really awesome. Um, and amazing. I guess we were lucky that we were a small group. And, you know, mm. it was did, were you go, did you go with friends or did you know them at all? Or okay. was it just yeah. all strangers? Not at all. Not at all. I, just had, I had just signed up on, uh, for it. There were two ladies that were friends. Uh -huh. Um, and, and then that, that girl that, you know, had the problems with her feet and me. Yeah. So it was just the four of us. And, right. um, it, no, it was actually, it was a nice group. And I think it was, it was kind of nice that 
we were a girls crew, girls, mm. girls only. You know, it it was because nobody had what you know got competitive with how fast exactly. you can walk or something like that. And you know, we we would actually take care of the weakest link in the group, and you know, yeah, yeah, things yeah. That, that could have turned out very differently. Um, so yeah, and then the year after that. I, de I decided to up my game a bit and actually <laughs> go for a hiking trip through the empty quarter in Oman, which is the biggest continuous sand desert in the world, apparently. And wow, it's really, really, really beautiful. But in comparison to the desert in Morocco, very monotonous. Like it all looks the same. They like these really high reddish sand dunes go on for kilometers. And we hiked eight or nine days. I don't even remember. And it looked the same every day. Right. So, and so much more exhausting because the we actually had to walk much longer and it was more hot. There was no wind. And e you could either walk on the top of the dune in the really soft sand or at the bottom on those flats where there was no air whatsoever. Mm. So, you know... It Both not great work. choices, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> so to me, that actually wasn't all that much fun. And then um, I sort of, I, it kind of sounds stupid, I got a bit lucky <laughs> because two of the people in the group didn't take uh, cope with the heat uh, too well. So one lady had to be picked up every day at lunch with a Jeep. And because I'm a doctor, the first few times I was sent with her to make sure she's okay. Oh, wow. Oh, she was that unwell. Yeah, she was pretty unwell. And then mm. there was another... I mean, it was always only while we were out there. As soon as we sort of got to the camp, she was fine. But right. you never know, you know. Mm -hmm. And then also on two or three days, um, a guy, like the oldest guy in the group, he was like 66 or something, also almost collapsed because mm. the speed was too high. You know, the guy who's the owner of that company actually um, didn't really pay too much attention to what's going on in the group. And he didn't, you know, mm. take care of the things. And so twice they had to sort of send the car another time to pick him up and um so i always had the choice of going with them at lunch and most of the days i did because i just didn't i didn't have to prove anything to myself yeah, you know i yeah, exactly walk for half the day and then spent the other half just in the camp again with the locals the mm -hmm. local crew would be there we would talk with them you know sometimes we had lunch with them they would play cards we would read our books and it was just Perfect. a nice atmosphere right mm. that otherwise wouldn't have been there i think in that second part of my chat with eva it's a really important lesson to remember that just because you set out on um, a particular hike even if you don't do every single bit of it on your own two feet it doesn't matter that's not the point it's not a competition you know it's all about the experience and uh, i think you've got to know when to keep walking and when you might need a break so or um, yeah i think that's a that's a really good attitude to have now, my final guest today is Talon Windwalker, and we chat about uh, some hiking he's done closer to towns. You don't have to be out in the middle of nowhere to get some really, really wonderful benefits of hiking. Yeah, so we did a lot of hiking before we left the U.S. Uh, we lived in Colorado, which is a very kind of nature-oriented state, um, and we lived near a lot of foothills and mountains and Colorado, the city that we live in has tons of green belt and pack, you know, or, um, trails and things like that. So it was, that was kind of a normal activity for us already. Mm. Um, so being able to do that in other countries and kind of see some, see both sides of, wow, so many things are similar and so many things are different and to be able to see that, but also, you know, not being afraid to go out into the hills where you get some of the views. Um, you know, we lived for a little bit in Brasov, Romania, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very cool town in a valley. And um, part of the town is still, it still has a lot of the medieval structure and some of it's a little bit more modern and some of it's very modern and out in the distance. Uh, but we lived in the historic area and occasionally we would hike up into the mountains that were right around the town and, and you could see such a different side of that city 
mm. by being up above. You could see the old medieval wall that used to, you know, it used to be a whole wall that was around the city, now it's just parts of it. But you could see that structure. You could see where the um, homes of the ancient Romanians that were there versus when the Saxons came in. Uh, and you could look and see that division very clearly. And uh, just from the way roofs were and the way homes were built, the, the way that Saxons were much more organized and things, you know, did things in a certain type of order, whereas the Romanian side was much different. Um, so seeing things from that angle as well is very fascinating. Uh, we also got to do some cave exploration up there and, um, oh, wow. And see some of the, you know, the villages, Romania, especially, I know some other European countries are like this as well, but especially Romania is one of those countries where you can be in, in a very kind of modern filling city. And within a few minutes out of the city, you step back in time and, you know, people are taking their hay bales by, you know, wagons being pulled by donkeys. And mm, um, cool. you're seeing the, the older clothing, you know, more traditional clothing that, so it's a very fascinating thing to be able to see all that as well. Yeah. Oh, I, and I really thoroughly take your point of being able to get up. If you're hiking up a hill and then the views that you get are really, it's not just that you can see a beautiful view, but yeah, looking down on a place, you can often learn a lot, can't you? Yeah. And, and just some of them are just so, so stunningly beautiful. I, we went to a fortress in another town in Romania called Rajnov. And you go up pretty good hill to get to that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, it was a fortress. And so they were trying to make sure that sucker was going to be safe. And it sure <laughs> was. But the view of the forest of just all these woods and everything from there was just breathtaking. And so you have this very interesting, you know, different sensations of standing here and realizing that especially for Americans, I'm sure you, you know, Australians feel similarly when you're around very old buildings, you know, mm. here, you know, our buildings, 1800s considered pretty old, actually, even early 1900s were like, Ooh, wow. old. Oh, same you here. Know? Yeah, absolutely. Anything yeah. that's a hundred years old is basically ancient to us. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, in Europe, a building from the 1200s, that's normal. So, yeah. you know, to stand there in this medieval fortress, and look out over these woods and think of all the things these these trees have seen and and how you're in this modern time but in this moment you feel like you could be there you know you're mm. looking around all these buildings are old there's nothing modern in sight um and just all these trees in the woods and it, you kind of feel like you've stepped back and it's just fascinating to to ponder life and what things were like and what these trees have seen and experienced and mm. those it, kinds of things you don't get just from hanging out in the city. I definitely don't think often enough about the possibilities of hiking close to home. Uh, in fact, just last week on the Thoughtful Travelers Facebook group, I posted about uh, visiting my dad out in the bush and ask people, you know, what else, where do you like going that's close to home but feels like you're traveling? And someone recommended or said that where they love to go is out walking in the Perth Hills. And that is such a, like an amazing, beautiful part of the world. It's maybe a 45 minute drive from me. And I can count on one hand the times I've been out there for a big walk and I really need to get out there some more. So I am publicly committing to doing that soon. Uh, maybe not quite now because we've had some crazy hot days. Uh, recently, it is the middle of summer here, but, um, but definitely when the weather is more consistently cool, I will be out there. So thank you so much for listening to episode 124 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I would love to hear some of your hiking stories too. Come and join the Facebook group. It's called Thoughtful Travelers. Uh, there's a link in the show notes, or you can just search for Thoughtful Travelers on Facebook and you'll find us. Uh, and come and share your tales of hiking wherever it is in the world that you've hiked and tell us what you love about it. I think there's so many benefits. It's great to be able to see the world, but be doing something um, healthy and in nature and just beautiful all at the same time. Um, while I mention the show notes, you'll find them for this episode at notaballerina.com slash 124 for episode 124. 
Uh, and let me tell you something more about everyone featured in the show. First up, our fabulous sponsor, Flytographer. So you can find them at flytographer.com. And don't forget, you'll get $50 off a photography shoot somewhere in the world, wherever you're traveling next, by using the code AMANDA50. Uh, I highly, highly recommend them. Uh, first up from the guest today, I chatted with Greg and his site is Chica and Sunsets, which you'll find at chicaandsunsets.com. Uh, and I will also leave a link to a great post he's written. I shared it recently in the Thoughtful Travelers Facebook group, so you might have seen it if you're a member. Uh, he did a great post about comparing the Appalachian Trail and the Camino de Santiago. And um, it was just a really well done post. So uh, go and have a look at that. Uh, next up, I chatted with Eva Vesteling of Not Scared of the Jet Lag. Now, just uh, I think today or yesterday on her blog at notscaredofthejetlag.com, Eva announced that she has quit her job and is about to start traveling indefinitely, which is pretty exciting. So you definitely want to go and check out her blog and see where she gets, uh, what she gets up to and where she goes. I know her first stint is going to be back in Morocco for a while. So um, I'm looking forward to following Ava's journey. And last but very far from least, I chatted with Talon Windwalker. You can find him at his website, onedadonekid.com. Both of those ones are the number one. So number one dad, number one kid.com. And you can also find Talon on Instagram at one dad, one kid as well. Uh, and uh, don't forget to come and join our Thoughtful Travelers Facebook group. It's the most fun place on Facebook, I promise. Lots of interesting discussions there because everyone's so like-minded and really wants to get the most out of travel. Thank you very, very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now. Bye.